This is a very short seminar on Madhurya Kandambini, which means the cloud bank of nectar by Srila Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur. So who here has read the Madhurya Kandambini? So now that we're all familiar with it, <laughs> we're not familiar with it. But basically speaking, the Madhurya Kandambini is a summary study of the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu by Srila Rupa Goswami because it goes over the different stages of development of Shraddha. So, as Sri Rupa Goswami said, Ado Shraddha, at first there is faith. So this faith, of course, is ultimately faith in Krishna and the process of devotional service. The process of devotional service or bhakti is causeless, as it explains here. That is, that there is no material cause. Generally speaking, in the material world, people perform activities in order to get some result. For instance, if one follows the Vedic literature, one expects to get some reward, that is, piety. But ultimately, that piety means that one has the peace of mind so that one can hear. And when one develops the power to hear, then one can acquire actual knowledge. Because actual knowledge means to realize the difference between ourselves and this body. But sometimes people take knowledge as something about understanding how the material nature works. That is a kind of knowledge, but ultimate gyan means to understand the difference between matter and spirit and who is the controller of both of them. And beyond, not exactly beyond, but along with gyan, there is the knowledge of yoga. That gyana will lead us to the platform of understanding if we actually want liberation from the material nature, we have to take to some kind of yoga process to realize that we're actually the body, not the body, that we're the soul within the body. By karma, we can become purified enough to be able to hear and acquire some knowledge. Ultimately, we learn that the ultimate, that ultimate knowledge is to realize that we're not the body and that to realize the Supreme Person in order to do that, then we take to the process of yoga. And of all the different kinds of yoga, bhakti yoga is recommended as the best yoga, yoginam apisaravesham, madgatain antaratmara, shradavan bhajateyumam sameyuktatamam adaha. Krishna says, yoginam apisaravesham, of all the different yogis, Yoginam Apisarvesham, Madgatain Antaratmana, one who is always thinking of me within himself, engaged in transcendent loving service, is the highest of them all. And then in the seventh chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Maya Asakta Manat Parata, Yogam Yunjan Manashraya, Asam Shayam Samagramam, Ita Gyasasi Tatsrinu. Uh, hear from me, O son of Pritha. So, in devotional service, there's also hearing, as in any process, but the difference is in devotional service, we hear from Krishna or from his representatives how to practice bhakti yoga specifically. And that bhakti yoga means to understand about Krishna in full. And when we understand about Krishna in full, free from doubt, then we understand everything as it really is. So Madhuri Kandambini is the process of gradually understanding Krishna. As Krishna says, Janma, Karma, Chame Divyam, Evam Yoveti Tattvataha, Tyaktva Deham Janma, 
Naiti Imam Eti Sarjana. One who can understand how Krishna appears in this world, that is not under the laws of karma, but by his own sweet will, and that his activities are all spiritual. Uh, it is difficult for the conditioned soul to understand exactly what spiritual activities are. Therefore, Krishna says, Bhakti Imam Abhijananti Yavan Yas Chasmi Tattvataha Titomam Tattvato Gyatva Vishite Tad Anantaram That one can understand me as I am only the pri by the process of devotion. So though in this world, karma or karma yoga is quite glorified. People go to the temple and they worship God but the idea is that they want, give me a house, give me a wife, give me a color TV, Om Jai Jagadisha Hari. <laughs> they want some material reward for their activity. So that's called karma yoga. But the actual fruit of karma yoga is that one understands that Simply by acquiring material things, one cannot be ha become happy because they're all temporary. One should seek something which is more substantial. But even by realizing that we're not the body, through the process of yoga, still, yenyera vendaksha vimukta maninas tvayasta bhavat avashudaya buddhaya, that one still doesn't have a clear conception of one's real identity. To find out what we're not, namely that we're not this body, doesn't mean we know who we actually are. That is our spiritual relation with Krishna. Nor do we actually understand what spiritual activity is just by understanding that we're a spirit. Because the spirit is not inactive, there is spiritual activity. But unless we understand that we're, realize that we're a spirit, and how can we engage in spiritual activities? Therefore, bhakti, devotional service, is said to be causeless because it doesn't arise out of fruit of activity or speculation or even by the process of yoga. It comes causelessly. And there's a long discussion in the Madhuri Khandambini about how bhakti is independent of karma, gyan, and yoga, and how it's above karma, gyan, and yoga, etc., etc. It's not caused by karma, gyan, or yoga. So what is the cause of bhakti? The cause of bhakti is the potency dis uh, given to the Madhyama Adhikari specifically to inspire one to perform the activities of devotional service. Generally speaking, the Uttama Adhikari devotee, he doesn't really preach because he thinks that everyone's a better devotee than he is, so there's no one to preach to. The Kanisa Adhikari preaches when they act on the second class platform their preaching is not quite as effective as one who's actually liberated, the Madhyam Adhikari devotee, because the Madhyam Adhikari at least has a clear vision of the difference between matter and spirit, and therefore his activities of loving Krishna, cooperating with the devotees to spread Krishna consciousness, helping out the innocent by spreading Krishna consciousness, and defeating the atheistic persons by spreading Krishna consciousness is on the steady platform with full conviction. Well, the Kinesa Adhikari has to be inspired or does or acts on the Madhyama Adhikari platform generally out of duty. We may not realize exactly who we are or what we're doing but we know we're supposed to do something, so we do it dutifully, and by that one gradually becomes, becomes the liberated platform. Liberated means to actually realize that Krishna is God and we are his servants. 
So that's called asam shayam samagram. So now we're hearing, and basically speaking, for most of us, we're hearing, so we become inspired to ultimately act in Krishna consciousness. And how to act in Krishna consciousness? Well, for the neophyte devotee, the beginning devotee, then at least we become inspired to have a home program every day where we sit down with our children and our husband and wife and we hear and chant about Krishna, offer food to the deity, etc. That's Ishvara Prema. Try to utilize the house and its assets to develop, to serve Krishna, Krishna Prema. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has made it very simple. He's asked to sit down, chant Hare Krishna together. And to do that generally takes a lot of faith means we have to turn the television off, can't be on internet or Facebook. It's a great austerity. And then to even bother to offer our food to Krishna, go through the austerity, that's sometimes seen as an austerity. But in any case, our philosophy is meant so at least in our household life, we sit down in the morning and the evening, we chant Hare Krishna, hear about Krishna, offer our food to Krishna. And then we, at least we learn how to cooperate with our family members in order to do that. Even the children, at least, they can clean the altar, give some water to the deities, etc. So then the family, or they say in the Christian religion, the family who prays together stays together. And then, when one is even more inspired, then one may try to help one's associates understand the value of Krishna consciousness. Preach to the innocent. That those who are bali sheshu, they become the object of kripa. Everyone is Krishna's eternal servant. Practically everyone in modern society is mad after sense gratification, simply following the propaganda as given by manufacturers of different products, simply meant to allure people to waste their money to buy things that actually ultimately don't lead to any higher consciousness, generally lead to the lowest consciousness possible. Especially nowadays, they train the children from the beginning to turn on the one-eyed guru. You know what the one-eyed guru is? Yes, the television. Because now it's the computer games that the whole purpose of life is to sit there and kill things that are on a screen, that appear on the screen. And the more things you kill, then the better person you are. And then afterwards, after you're done killing, then you go out and buy things. Buy another game so you can kill more things. Therefore, one has to become detached from modern propaganda and to enjoy the senses to the end of life is the prime necessity of human civilization. Because we can see, as Krishna says, there's no end to people's anxiety. People, are, if you go downtown, people are rushing here and there, full of anxiety. To get somewhere or get something which will simply fill them with more anxiety. People can't go to hell quick enough. They're ashamed that they're going by bus while other people are taking a jet engine to get there. So one has to learn, at least in family life, to love Krishna, cooperate with the family members, try to help innocent people. Whoever we meet, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, we should try to tell them about Krishna. 
So that means our only actual relationship with everyone else is to assist them in their relation with Krishna. In the material concept of life, we think that we can help someone. We can help someone if we tell them that Krishna can help them. And if we don't tell people that Krishna can help you, then we're not either helping them and we're not helping ourselves either. Because we'll forget that the solution to our problems, ultimate solution, is that we have to come back to our Krishna consciousness again. We have to revive our relation with Krishna. Everything else is superficial. And for the atheist propaganda, that the purpose of life is to accumulate money for sense gratification, or even for liberation, that one has to be able to become detached from such propaganda by development of actual real knowledge, so that one is not so much affected by thoughts of sense gratification. They come and they'll go, and one should fix one's attention on the activities of devotional service. So that's in the beginning stage. And then when one becomes more advanced, then one actually becomes more inclined to not only become Krishna conscious in the family, but one becomes more interested in helping others become Krishna conscious. That is to act on the Madhyama Adhikari platform. Uh, even in our being Kanistadhikaris or beginning devotees. Still, if we want to go beyond being a, a beginning devotee, we have to act by loving Krishna, cooperating with the devotees to serve Krishna, preaching to the innocent, trying to help anyone we meet become Krishna conscious, and at the same time, try to detach ourselves from all the allurements of material, present material society. especially by trying to defeat atheistic propaganda. So, Madhurya Kandambini says that bhakti is independent. It doesn't matter if we're greatly advanced, if we're just beginning. Still, if we perform the activities of devotional service, then gradually we'll make progress. That there is no need to become qualified by detachment or dutiful activities. There's no need to become first qualified by understanding the difference between matter and spirit. There's no need to practice yoga by fixing the mind upon Krishna through the process of Stanga Yoga. All the, though these processes, well, we should say that these processes naturally develop if one is actually engaged in the process of devotional service, especially by chanting Hare Krishna, by hearing Shrimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita, by worshiping the deities, by trying to make the atmosphere spiritual, and by cooperating with the devotees in service to Krishna. So by these activities of devotional service, uh, even if one is greatly advanced or not so advanced, one will get the result of making progress in Krishna consciousness. So Sri Rupa Goswami, he goes over as a Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu or the Nectar of Devotion, the devotional service unfolds in the beginning as two state on the two qualities in sadhana bhakti namely kleshagni and subhada two leaves uh, kleshagni means it frees one from all material distress and subhada means it gives one all good qualities so kleshagni means that by our very desire to satisfy our senses is itself distressful. And it's even more distressful when it's done in an irregular way. That is, when one's eating, sleeping, mating, defending 
are simply done without any regulation. So by devotional service or any kind of religious process, then these activities are regulated. And therefore, as they're regulated, therefore the distress arising from them diminishes. But by bhakti, then these things are gradually actually eliminated. Regulating the senses is certainly helpful, just like if you want to take poison, better to take it a few drops every day and get used to it, rather than taking a glass at a time. But bhakti means instead of taking poison, we're actually we become purified from whatever poison we've already taken. And subhada means that as we become liberated from our material concept of life, then we actually become positively relieved from distress, which we call happiness. Just like when we have a toothache, there's a lot of distress. We pray to the dentist, please save me. And when the dentist saves us from the distress, then we feel good. We feel happy. It's not real happiness, it's the relief from distress, but in one sense, it seems like happiness. And devotional service can bring one to the freedom from all distress, which is really, Krishna says, prasanatma. We feel positively peaceful. No worries, Mike. <laughs> She'll be right. She will be right if she performs devotional service. Otherwise, there is going to be a lot of worries, Mike. <laughs> and it's beneficial for everyone. Everyone, as Prabhupada said in his happening album, everyone can perform devotional service. Prabhupada said even a dog can benefit if he takes part in the kirtan. Even a child can take part. So it's, everyone can perform devotional service, everyone can be benefited, it's auspicious for everyone, and it gives one all good qualities. And the happiness in devotional service surpasses even that greatest material uh, pleasure from sense gratification. So then Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur explains that in the beginning there is some faith called sadha, shraddha, which means focusing our attention and giving our love to Krishna. Because Krishna is the reservoir of pleasure. Now, when we chant Hare Krishna, we may not experience an ocean of bliss, as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu mentions, cheto darpanam arjanam, bhava mahadavagni nirvapanam, shreya kairava chandrika vitaranam, Vidya Varu Jivanam, Anandam Bhudivardhanam, Anandam Bhudivardhanam. We may not be rolling in the ground in ecstasy when we're chanting Japa in the morning. Our Sikha is in our hand, hair may not stand on end every time we say Hare Krishna. Matter of fact, we may be falling into samadhi. <laughs> Deep trance which no one dares wake us up from. But that doesn't mean that Krishna is not the reservoir of pleasure or that Krishna's name is not the reservoir of pleasure. It means that we lack the qualification to actually experience what the holy name, who the holy name is or experience the holy name. But if we get a little sud, sud means the heart, we agree to concentrate a little bit upon the holy name and give our enthusiasm to chanting, then we get proportionally the effect. So a little liking at the beginning means that material life, as Sri Vishnu Chakravati Thakur says, is in full force. But there's a little space in our lives for a spiritual life.
And by that little space for spiritual life, we may realize that if I want to make the space a little bit bigger, then I have to associate with the devotees. Asat Sangha, oh well, Sadhu Sangha, Sadhu Sangha, Sarva Shasa Hoy, Lava Matra, Sadhu Sangha, Sarva Siddhi Hoy. Because by association of devotees, we can learn something about Krishna. If we want to learn something, then we can hear. That's why Krishna says, touch Shinu, hear from me or his representatives how we can practice devotional service. So the real purpose of hearing is to hear how we can engage at least in bhajana kriya, how we can chant Hare Krishna in such a way as to gradually become free from the ten offenses, which Sri Vishnu Chakravati Thakura will go over in the Madhurya Kandambini, how we can worship the deities properly, how we can reach Shrimad Bhagavatam to understand what is the process of devotional service, Bhagavad Gita, how to properly associate with the devotees, and how to make the atmosphere spiritual, not only in the temple, not only in our house, but even in the society at large, especially by doing Harinam, distributing transcendental literature, distributing transcendental books, and ultimately to create in this world a transcendental spiritual revolution to convince people that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So by these, especially these potent processes, we learn from the devotees how to perform them so that we can become fixed in our sadhana. That is, generally speaking, our sadhana, these five powerful processes. That's called bhajana kriya. And in bhajana kriya, Srila Vishnu Chakravati Thakur breaks it up into different stages. Of course, sadhu, sangha, shraddha, these are vast realms of consciousness. We're actually dealing with consciousness more than just external activities. We're dealing with people's internal experience of what reality is. So as the room for Krishna consciousness expands, then gradually our materialistic conception of life decreases. And our, this world, instead of being seen, simply as a, an expansion of the illusory energy becomes seen as an expansion of Krishna's spiritual energy. So, in Bhajana Kriya, there are different stages, beginning with Utsaha Mayi. Utsaha Mayi means generally when we first take to Bhajana Kriya, we become puffed up with enthusiasm. Sri Vishnu Chakravati Thakur says, just like a young man or young lady, they start studying the books and they think themselves to be a great scholar. So at the beginning, because of our limited experience of what actually Krishna consciousness means, then Krishna sometimes gives us some special mercy to encourage us to follow the path to devotional service but our conclusion is that we're great devotees. That no one is better than I am because Krishna is showing special mercy to me, so I'm a special person. Srimati Rarani thinks herself to be insignificant, and so does Krishna, but that's because they have some, maybe some, uh, what do they call that? Not as prestige. What do they call it when people have low esteem? They have low self-esteem. <laughs> but I don't have that problem because I'm a great devotee. That Shemadurai Rani thinks herself to be the most fallen of all the devotees, but when I get back to the spiritual world, I'll help her out. Now, at the beginning, we may get some, some mercy from Krishna, but in our conditioned stage of life, 
we cannot really conceive of what actually devotional service means. Because if we could conceive of it, we wouldn't be in the material condition of life. So we just have to ask ourselves, do I still identify myself with this gross and subtle body? Do I still have any desire for gross or subtle material sense gratification? If I, the answer is yes, then I can understand that I really don't understand that much about pure devotional service. But still one becomes puffed up, but that's good to associate with the devotees because they'll, in the association of devotees, no one can stay puffed up for very long. <laughs> the devotees are very merciful. They always kindly remind us of who we are actually. So then, therefore, one starts realizing I'm not the great, steady, unalloyed devotee that I imagine myself to be. So that's Gana Tarala, alternating thick and thin. At the beginning, we're very proud of our great attendance at Mangalarti, our, our chanting our rounds without fail, unlike all these other senior devotees who have fallen away because they weren't as qualified as I am. But then after some time, we start realizing I'm not as steady as I thought I was. Sometimes I'm completely up and sometimes I'm completely down. Sometimes I'm very enthusiastic, and sometimes I'm depressed. I'm like a yo-yo. Sometimes I'm Vaikuntha, and then zhuk, <laughs> Gana Tarala, alternating thick and thin. Either I'm fully absorbed, or I'm fully unabsorbed, or absorbed in the wrong thing. But then once one has some experience, one desires, because everything is based on desire, to make tangible pro progress, to become steadier. So therefore, one becomes resolved that I'm not going to, I'm only going to chant, some, I'm going to chant all my rounds before a Mangalarti. I'm going to get up in such and such time, or we should say, I'm not going to, I'm going to restrict my sense gratification to the minimum. I'm going to fast on akadasi. I'm not going to, et cetera, et cetera. So every akadasi comes, and I vow to be strict and control my senses. And during the whole akadasi, I don't take even a drop of water. It's called nil jal. Of course, I have a big feast, but I don't take a drop of water. <laughs> <laughs> So I strictly follow the old Jalakadasi. <laughs> but sometimes devotees don't even take any prasad on a kadasi, but all during the kadasi they're meditating. Today is a kadasi. I'm taking some, I'm not taking any prasad, no no water, unlike all these other sense gratifiers in the temple <laughs> who can't control their senses or pretending that they're devotees. But I'm a real devotee, therefore I'm fasting. And there's only 23 hours and 59 minutes left. And the, <laughs> <laughs> and then I can honor Prashad again. <laughs> but I'm a great devotee, therefore I'm going through this great austerity. And now it's only 23 hours and 58 minutes left. So during a codice, one is following very strictly, and the mind is completely on prasad the whole 24 hours. And then finally, when it's time for prasad, one thinks, now I deserve, now I'm going to get what I deserve. Lord Krishna, you're up there, and I'm down here. Let's eat. <laughs> Go for it. So then one realizes that I'm wasting my time. I should be thinking about Krishna. I should be learning real detachment. So then one becomes absorbed in making vows that I should become detached. I should give up sense gratification. And therefore, the excessive speculation how to give up sense gratification. That now I'm a brahmachari. I should go to Vrindavan. I should renounce everything. 
I should simply hear and chant about Krishna. But in order to go to Vrindavan, I'm going to have to buy a ticket, and I don't like to collect, so maybe I should get married, and my wife can go out and collect. And then we can go to Vrindavan and renounce everything together. But if I get married, and I have a wife, then I may have to do some work, and therefore I may not want to get married, so one is simply speculating that maybe I should take sannyas, maybe I should get married, maybe I should get married and then take, maybe I should get married and then take sannyas, or maybe take sannyas and then get married. <laughs> <laughs> so that's called excessive speculation. So one is either in, in a state of renunciation or in a state of sense gratification, but Krishna is far away. Krishna is not in the picture. We're simply trying to get free from the material influence. And when one realizes that, then one thinks, now I'm going to strictly follow. Every day I'm going to get up at such and such time. In the first week, one gets up at 2, two o'clock. The next week it's 2.30. The next week it's 3 o'clock, then 3.30. And then, oh, well, let me not get up. So that's called niyama kshama. One man is making so many vows, but having a hard time following it. And then finally, if one follows the process, then one develops some sense of understanding that we're not the greatest, and that one becomes a little steady in the execution of devotional service. One gives up excessive uh, detachment or, for, or an alternating between renunciation and sense gratification. One becomes steady in the vows, and then one comes to the stage of taranga rangini, enjoying the small waves of devotional service. That is, probably gives the example, or gave the example at the end of 1977, that in the absence of a big tree, then a small castor bush looks like a big tree. So in the absence of actual understanding what the qualifications of pure devotional service are, how exalted are the advanced devotees, that even a devotee who's steady and has some good, is manifesting some good qualities, then they appear to be a great Mahabhagavan but they're just on the stage of trying to get out of the material energy and therefore trying to become steady in pure devotional service. And from the stage of Taranga Rangini, generally sometimes the devotees become attached to the little fruits of pure devotional service. One gets praise, one gets money, one gets followers, everything Chaitanya Mahaprabhu didn't want, one gets think, wow, well, now I finally am recognized. I'm a recognized devotee. But these things are impediments, and therefore the next stage is called uh, anartha nivriti, trying to get free from the consciousness that I'm here to enjoy nadadam janam sundarim kavitam va jagadisha kamaye. So this is the stage of anartha nivriti. I don't need money, I don't need followers, I don't need the encouragement of others, and I don't even need liberation from material existence. I'm simply happy and uh, I have gratitude that Krishna is allowing me to engage in his devotional service. So that gratitude all the time in any circumstance allows one to actually engage in pure devotional service. Tatenu kampam susamikshamano punjana evatma kritam vipakam yadvag vivir vidanmanaste jivetas bhukti sade sadaya bhakti. That the gratitude that I'm engaged in devotional service and therefore whether there is praise, whether there is infamy, whether there is appreciation, whether there is gain or loss, one simply steadily engages in devotional service, so one comes to the stage of nishta, which is actually liberation. Ainandana tununja kinkaram patita mam vishame bhavam budo. 
I fall into the ocean of material existence, and I may have to go through good times and bad times here, like Prahlad Maharaj, but let me remain steady in your devotional service. Fix me as one of the atoms at your lotus feet. So that's the beginning of actually pure devotional service, unmotivated and uninterrupted, which the Vishnu Takavati Kaikura explains in detail, as some of our other acharyas explain too, but we don't, don't have the time here. And then from that stage, one comes to the stage of ruchi. Of course, this is all gradual development. Our development is less like you put an iron in the fire and then the iron gets hotter and hotter and hotter and it eventually becomes just like the fire. Of course, if we put the iron in the fire and then we take it out of the fire and put it into ice water, it's not going to be that hot. And then you put it back in the fire and then put it. So it's never really going to get extremely hot if we're alternating between the fire and the ice water. But then gradually one keeps the iron in the fire longer. And even if one takes it out, he doesn't put it into the ice water. He simply takes it out and then puts it back. And eventually the iron stays in the fire and it gets hotter and hotter and hotter. So after liberation means that the iron devotional service is no longer taken out of the fire, one remains steady in one's activities of pure devotional service, and then gradually one can feel Krishna's presence by chanting Hare Krishna, and one can see everyone and everything in relationship to Krishna, and that become, and one feels growing appreciation and love for Krishna. And that becomes intensified until one comes to the platform of Ruchi. So at the stage of Ruchi, every time one chants Hare Krishna, one can feel Krishna's presence. And one sees Krishna everywhere, all the time. One can see that the pictures of Krishna, they are Krishna, that the deity is Krishna, that there is no difference between Krishna and his name, there's no difference between the form of Krishna and Krishna, and one can see everyone and everything in relationship to Krishna. And everything becomes, as it says in the Brahma Samhita, enjoyable and tasty. And that comes to the platform of a sakti. So a sakti means that the happiness is so great that one cannot exist without that happiness of being in association with Krishna, just like a fish cannot live without the association of water. And that comes to the platform of bhava. When one's actual feelings towards Krishna are awakened, that Krishna is no longer an abstract personality of Godhead, he's actually one's intimate associate, one wants to intimately associate with one, because one actually has feeling or love for Krishna. One's concentration on Krishna is steady enough, one's thinking about Krishna's pastimes are steady enough that one actually desires to enter into those pastimes with a certain feeling. And that feeling is our spiritual identity. That is a particular rasa that we have, and that's called bhava. And as it says in the Madhuri Kandambini, that, or the other literatures, like the Nectar of Devotion, bhava is one ray in the sunlight of prema. We can imagine one ray of sunlight is not considered very significant compared to the sunshine. For us, Bhava is an inconceivably advanced position, but in the realm of pure devotional service, Bhava is just one ray in the intensity of Prema. And Prema is simply the introduction to pure unalloyed rasa. Because on the higher stages, of, of Dasya, Sakya, Vatsalya, and Madhurya Ras, it goes from Prema to Sneha to Mana to Raga, Anuraga, Bhava, and Mahabhava, which are successive intensities of pure Prema. 
Therefore, we think we've already understood what devotional service is about. We should probably read Madhuri Kandambini. Then we'll get a, <coughs> an idea that the stages are inconceivable, but at least before liberation, the stage that we're probably at, that there is a process we can follow and that the process is called sadhana bhakti, to try to appreciate the opportunity that we have to chant Hare Krishna, to read Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita, to worship the deities, to associate with the devotees, especially for service to the deities in the temple, in our home, or in the Sankirtan movement. And to try to make the atmosphere spiritual in the temple, in our home, in the world. So to be given that opportunity to engage in these five powerful processes, plus the nine limbs of bhakti, the 64 angas given by Srila Rupa Goswami, is a great opportunity so that gradually we can actually come to the higher stages of bhakti. Not only engage in bhajana kriya, gradually come to the platform of anarti nivritti, freedom from all our unwanted material conceptions and desires, become steady in devotional service, develop a taste for devotional service, an attachment to devotional service, feelings of love for Krishna, and eventually reestablish our relation with Krishna and begin our actual spiritual life again. So I, I've only given a very brief summary of Madhurya Kandambini. There's a lot more we can say, but if I can find, I'll just give a little <coughs> Summary here, which the Rupa Goswami says. So I'll just read this, and we'll ask for questions. When the materialistic aspect of ahanta, which means false ego, and mamata, that is, it is mine, is extremely deep, one remains in the cycle of birth and death. When a causeless particle of faith develops, one thinks of becoming a Vaishnava and serving the Lord. Shanta, Ahanta, and Mamata become slightly spiritualized, and the Jiva becomes qualified for devotional service. At the stage of Sadhu Sangha, the tinge of spiritualization becomes more concrete. At the stage of Anishnata Bhajna Kriya, the spiritualization is localized in one place, whereas the material aspect is in full force. So generally it means that when we're performing devotional service, we're in, we can experience something called spiritual, what it means. But when we go outside the association of devotees and our, quote, normal activities, then sometimes the materialistic conceptions are in full force. At the stage of nishta, liberation, spiritualization becomes more pervasive and the materialistic influence decreases somewhat. Quite surprising, even at liberation, when I've more or less realized I'm not this body to, some, to a large extent, still materialistic influence is still there. At the state of Ruchi, spiritualization of me and mine becomes dominant and the material aspect, aspect becomes localized. At the state of asakti, the spiritual aspect becomes complete and the materialistic, material aspect becomes a trace. At the state of bhava, the spiritual aspect becomes thorough and the material aspect becomes a shadow, occasionally appearing. At the state of prema, the spiritual aspect becomes extremely intense and the material aspect is completely absent. So if we ever have a material thought, don't worry about it, that even at the stage of bhava, that sometimes there's a little trace in material consciousness. So if we have a little bit more than a trace. We may not be on, in bhava, but we shouldn't be surprised. At the stage of bhajana kriya, meditation on the Lord is mixed with other topics and is temporary. At the stage of nishta, meditation on the Lord has a trace of other topics. At the stage of ruchi, other topics are absent and meditation is long-lasting. 
At the stage of asakti, meditation becomes deep. During bhava, by meditation, the Lord appears in the mind. Achieving prema, along with the appearance of the Lord in the mind, there is direct association with the Lord. So this is just to give us some idea that anytime we remember Krishna and we're performing devotional service, we can think or consider ourselves quite fortunate and that this will gradually lead to the higher stages of devotional service if we execute devotional service with some sincerity and with some care and attention. So I'll stop there. Is there any questions? Yes. Our devotional service should be unmotivated and uninterpreted. Yes. So, service sometimes get in, gets interpreted. So, what should we do? Start it again. Oh. <laughs> Krishna says, wherever the mind wanders to its flickery and unsteady nature, one should withdraw it and bring it back under the control of the self. So, the yogi who has fixed his mind upon me barely attains the highest state of transcendental happiness by virtue of his identity with Brahman, his passion is acquired, he becomes peaceful and he becomes free from all sin. So wherever we left off, we just take up again. Anything else? Yes. Uh, out of the chanting progress from the different states, Well, Srila Bhakti Nanata Kora says in his Namhata, which I can't remember exactly all the details, but he says something like the he gives it different design, he gives it different medals, like bronzes, sun and bhakti, something like silver is nishta, and it goes on gold is bhava, touchstone is prema. So he said at the stage of sun and bhakti, when we were chanting, before Nishta, then we get the right to chant, to associate with Krishna by continuously chanting. At the state of Nishta, then when we chant Hare Krishna, we generally remember Krishna's form. We remember what he looks like. And at the state of Ruchi, we feel Krishna's presence. At the state of Asakti, we remember Krishna's pastimes. Or we could say at Ruchi, we remember his qualities. The stage of Asakti, we remember his pastimes. At the stage of Bhava, we feel, <coughs> we remember along with the pastimes, we feel the feelings of the associates of Krishna in those pastimes. And at the stage of Prema, we enter into the pastimes. Yes. Especially in the beginning of Krishna consciousness, you're completely unqualified to get any, any flavor for, for Krishna from chanting or from service. But still, still sometimes we, like, um, you get, especially in the beginning, it feels like there's actually, you can get so much taste from, from worship service. But uh, where does it come from? It comes from Krishna. And where, why does he take it away again? Yeah. Oh, because we're not, it, he doesn't take it away. Well, we could say sometimes. Due to our past good activities or activities in devotional service, we become qualified to be inspired by Krishna in different ways. But because we're not, we're also, we have our free will, we also have attachments for different types of material desires. Therefore, by the five powerful processes of devotional service, when they're executed with sincerity and with concentration, and even in, then, even in the neophyte stages, who Rupa Goswami says, one can experience ecstasy through concentration on those five powerful processes. But that doesn't mean because I'm experiencing ecstasy, now I'm a great devotee. It just means that somehow or another, I was able to concentrate my attention with some sincerity on those five processes. Therefore, I've understood how powerful they actually are to some degree. But because I'm attached to material external ideas and sense gratification, therefore I become distracted. Generally it fits in. We get, we feel su we're suffering, we pray to Krishna, help me, give me some happiness, give me some attachment to you. Krishna reveals himself, 
gives us the intelligence to concentrate, take shelter of the five processes. We feel a little happiness and ecstasy. We think ourselves to be great devotee, and we want to take a break in Maya because I'm so great. Maya won't affect me anymore. And then we get entangled in Maya, and then we go back praying to Krishna, save me. We go up and down. Anything else? All right, thank you very much. Grantaraj, Madhurya Kandavini, Kijai. Srila Prabhupada, Kijai. Four permanent days.